may have noticed, but we've actually dropped one session behind. Uh, so that um, I could have just gone with the flow and forgot about the session, but uh, I decided it's, it's really too important to let it go. So if you have the handout from last time, we did not get to that. That's what we're going to do tonight. Uh, I have extra copies of it out on the table where you came in. Uh, we're going to be looking at uh, the New Testament prophets tonight. Uh, John the Baptizer and Jesus. And we'll start that in a second. I um, brought with me, uh, since we're going to be entering into the New Testament uh, tonight for this session, um, I thought I'd like to have something that you can pass around and hold in your hand. Um, do you all recall Jesus' parable about the uh, foolish virgins? Remember? Uh, they were supposed to greet the bridegroom as he came. Uh, and there were those who brought enough oil and those who did not bring enough. Want me to take next time? It's hard to really get the point of it because it's easy to think, well, doggone it, anyone could, you know, not quite bring enough oil along, right? Uh, why did they get the rough end of the deal because they ran out of oil? Uh, well, here I brought for you, it's a replica. I actually have a real one, but I don't take it out of the house. I have a replica of a first century Herodian spatulated oil lamp. This would have been the most commonly used oil lamp uh, in Jesus' day. So, shouldn't you just out of common sense bring a little juglet of extra oil along? Yes? So that when, and we'll start here with Karen. Um, so that when it says that they were foolish, it meant that they really, really, really um, slipped up. They just, they should have, this is so obvious. This is like going out to your car and forgetting your car keys. Well, we've all done that. Uh, have, has anyone here ever locked your keys in your car? That is why I only buy cars they have keyless entry buttons. Because <laughs> I locked my keys in a couple of times over the years. So anyway, as you're passing that around, um, it's really um, a well-done replica. Uh, it would be hard, uh, at first glance, hard to distinguish that from the real thing. Um, of course, a ceramicist could in a, in a heartbeat. But they've even torched the, uh, the tip of it with a little bit of carbon to make it look like it was actually used uh, and burned. Uh, the, there are shops in uh, Jerusalem uh, and tourist stops that sell those as the real thing. So, so for those who may be going to the Holy Land in the spring, in March, don't just go into a shop and buy pottery that they tell you is ancient. Especially when you see 240 of them. Especially, and they're all identical. And underneath it says, made in China. Don't buy it. Talk to me, in summary again, talk to me about prophets. What do prophets do? They foretell. For tell, forth tell, yeah. Put a th there. They forth tell. They speak to God's people the word that God has for them. Um, that does include promises for the future, or yeah, I I hate to use the word threat because it almost makes God seem small. But it is, um, one could put it that way. 
Um, so, are you having a hard time keep, keeping the dot? I'm so sorry. Uh, ANSI kind of guy. Um, and um, I'll stay close to the phone. Um, so they forth tell, and sometimes that includes a future promise. Sometimes that includes um, warning. I think I'd rather say warning than threat. A future warning that if you do not turn around, if you do not repent, that this terrible outcome is inevitable. It is just inevitable. Now, interesting, it's interesting um, that when we had the, um, the uh, Superstorm Sandy along the East Coast, and a lot of damage was done there, um, who was the, uh, one of the candidates who worked in the primaries, was it two times ago, I guess? He was a governor in Oklahoma, Kansas, not governor. Uh, a pastor, minister, maybe he was also governor. Huckabee. 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 Huckabee actually went public recently and said that God did not protect America. I think it was Huckabee anyway. Uh, did not protect America from this storm because, and you know, kind of prophetic sounding, because we're, we're bad people. Um, and we do bad things. Well, we do bad things, don't we, as a country? That's for sure. Um, but it is that sense, that almost Old Testament prophetic sense, uh, that God will withdraw God's protective care of the people, his people, uh, if they break the covenant, if they're not faithful and if they are not good. Now, the problem with that pronouncement today is we stand on the other side of the cross and the empty tomb, which changes the game, changes the covenant. Uh, this morning when Pastor Mike was at the altar and he said the words of institution again, uh, this is my blood of the new covenant shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Now we are operating under a new covenant um, that doesn't fully resemble the old one uh, and um, doesn't necessarily supersede it, but it is a covenant, well it does, it supersedes it for those um, who don't want to be bound to the unkeepable old covenant. Um, anyway, so uh, a prophet forth tells, tells God's will and God's word to God's people, uh, corrects them. Prophets also, by the way, we didn't do this because if you look at some of the prophets written in the historical books that we call the former prophets, you'll see that the prophets uh, also, at least those did, can work miracles, right? Elijah and the widow, uh, and her oil and flour. Um, and so, um, in a sense, prophets may also carry the kind of God-given power to do supranatural things. Supra means above nature. Supernatural nat natural means just bigger than normal. So the Olympian gods of Greece are supernatural because they're just big, uh, bulky on steroids, human-like guys and gals who are always fighting, right? Uh, supernatural means to be over nature, to be above it all and to have power over it all. Who categorized prophets as major and minor? Oh, actually Judaism. Uh, that comes out of uh, rabbinic Judaism. Okay. What else do prophets do? They do silly things, goofy things, crazy things. They make a scene, right? They also, who do they speak to? 
They'll speak to the higher-ups and to the people of God as well and to the priesthood, to the religious leaders. They speak to all of those uh, with authority. And those who hear the prophets speak usually are in fact um, somewhat in awe of them because not only do they just, not only are they good, powerful public speakers, but they're weird. Uh, weird people have a tendency to capture our imagination. I have found as I look back over life, some of the people that I've just really been attracted to, uh, not Karen, <laughs> okay. but those people who have interested me are people who are a little bit on the edge. Do you ever find that with yourself? Or do you always have to play it safe and have someone who's completely and absolutely normal like you are? <laughs> now, that's taking a lot for granted, isn't it, Alan? Uh, were, were not prophets considered radical and yes. um, rejected? Oh, yeah, sure. Um, you, you stood in awe of them, um, and you... You feared them, but that doesn't mean you didn't do bad things to them. Jeremiah was beaten up. He was put in the stocks. He was thrown in a dry well. We know all that from the writings of Baruch. Well, I mean, they're, they're not accepted until after they're dead. Right? Is that right? Or... Even, well, accepted's a funny word. Their message may be accepted, but it may not be appreciated. Uh, and it may not be followed. I just, uh, on um, the Turner Classic Network, or whatever it's called, I just watched King of Kings about a week ago. I remember going to see it in, I think it was 1962, uh, or 61. I remember going to see it as an eighth grader. Uh, and uh, um, it was vividly portrayed again what happened to John the Baptizer for me in that old movie. Uh, and uh, here's a difference between then and now. Then we were in the theater, right? And we sat and we watched it on the big screen. Now I watched it on my home screen. And as a new star would come on, Ryan O'Neill playing a Roman you know, <laughs> centurion. Oh, please. I mean, but anyway, uh, what did I do? Flipped up my iPad and typed in Ryan O'Neill and read his bio on the Wikipedia as I'm watching him on the screen. That is so sad. And you just need to know that your pastor succumbs to this unsatiable need for information and data. Uh, on, on a minute-to-minute -minute basis. Um, so prophets could be punished, but they were almost always uh, somewhat feared. Okay, so that's the prophets. Let's kind of talk a little bit about uh, the intertestamental period. Using rough numbers here, by intertestamental, I mean that era that we do not have um, necessarily uh, historical canonic works, you know, accepted canon of scripture, written works from. We have written works from this period, um, but they are often propagandistic, like the books of the Maccabees, which are actually in the Roman Catholic uh, scriptures but they are not canonic books, um, but they are certainly propagandistic. There's no doubt about that. Uh, and, and, but probably somewhat historically accurate, uh, uh, more or less. But during this period, um, we don't have a whole lot of information about the, the faith and the development of the faith of God's people. Um, except for some writings here and there. Uh, and it's often referred to as the uh, Second Temple period because the temple in Jerusalem is rebuilt after the return from exile. And it is the sec Second Temple period all the way up to the time of Jesus. Herod the Great, uh, when Jesus is um, 
just before Jesus is born, uh, rebuilds the temple, and it becomes the Herodian period, but it's still sort of subsumed under uh, the idea of the second temple period. That ends in 70 AD with the destruction of, the final destruction of the temple by the Romans. Anyone been in Rome? Have you walked through the Arch of Titus at the end of the forum there? If you looked up as you're walking this way through it, which is towards the Colosseum, you look on the right-hand side up there, and what do you see? You see the Roman soldiers carting off the treasures of the Holy of Holies of the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem in 70 AD. And if you look closely, you'll see that one of the soldiers, or two of them, are carrying out this humongous, my grandson's favorite word now, this humongous menorah, sevenfold candle, candlestick. They're carrying that out. Plus, they're also carrying out um, uh, the ark, or whatever it looks sort of like the ark. Uh, they're taking all the treasures of the Jewish temple. And, uh, uh, and from those treasures, guess what they would build? The Colosseum. So if you've ever been in Rome and you've been to the Colosseum, you look at that and you should not only just see a magnificent structure and building, but you should also see the destruction of Jerusalem and the looting and destruction of the Temple of Jerusalem. Because the, uh, the wealth from the Temple helped to pay for the building of the Colosseum in Rome. You can kind of see how everything is sort of tied together. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that interesting? How that works? Let's look more at the intertestamental timeline that I have here. Um, we have the Medes and so-called Persians, right? Uh, the the Medo-Persian Empire. And you've got Cyrus and Cambyses II and Darius I uh, from oh, 530 to 400. <laughs> Um, who basically have control uh, over that portion of the Middle East and therefore of the people of Jerusalem and Judah, Judea, later Judea. Uh, you have Persian rule, Artaxerxes, Darius II, uh, Artaxerxes II and the third, Arsis, would you love to have a name like that? <laughs> Man, they, people could have fun with calling you an arsis. Uh, and Darius III. Um, Hellenistic rule under Alexander the Great, which really goes beyond Alexander, but that's the initiative, the initiating period. He doesn't last long. Um, he should have never gone to the Indus River. Um, and um, he, of course, came down with a disease and died of it. But his generals... His generals inherited the empire. And so what you have are two of his, the families of his generals, the Ptolemaic and the Seleucid dynasties, that one up in Syria, the other down in Egypt, fighting uh, for a long time, uh, basically for almost 200 years, fighting back and forth always for control of... Um, the area of Palestine, Canaan, uh, that section in between the two. And what you really have is you've got the Ptolemies of Egypt and the Seleucids of Syria. Who was the most, probably the most famous Ptolemy of all time? Cleopatra, yeah. Cleopatra. She was not an Egyptian. She was a part of the ruling class in Egypt uh, of this Hellenistic uh, culture and period descended down from Alexander the Great. Um, by the way, why do historians call this period the Hellenistic period? Greek. Greek, but what has Hellenistic got anything to do with Greek? Hellos, you know, Greece. Uh, Helen of Troy. Helen of Troy, uh, whether she was for real or not, Helen of Troy gave her name to Greece and Greek culture. Uh, and so it is 
uh, the Hellenistic period. The Europeans call it Hellas. Hellas, they do, yeah. Mm -hmm. And if you're a postage stamp collector, you'll notice that on Greek postage stamps, it says in Greek, Hellas. Um, okay. Um, this is a tough time. This is an extremely, this is probably one of the most horrible times for the history of God's people. Especially when the Seleucids of the north, of the area of Syria, when they had control. Because they were bound and determined to Hellenize, to make Greek the whole Middle East. And especially those areas under their control. The Ptolemies of Egypt, well, they were more laid back. Just pay your taxes, you know, give us what we want, and you know, we're okay with that. Uh, not the Seleucids. It, you were no good until you were Hellenic. What do you think that means for religion? Because if you're going to be Hellenized, you're also going to have to embrace the Olympian gods and all the other gods and goddesses uh, of Greek culture. And the Seleucids tried to impose that upon the Jews. The only, well, that's a little too narrow, um, a truly monotheistic religion that believed in one God. One of the Seleucid kings, Antiochus the, I don't remember, third, fourth, in order to try and give them some shock and awe, ordered that pigs, pigs, be slaughtered and sacrificed in the temple. Double insult, right? Double insult. So you can imagine that by this point in time, Jews are growing in their fervor for a Messiah to deliver them. That their, their whole world revolves around um, the, the promise of a coming deliverer. And you can see why, that, why in Jesus' day, the, the so-called Messiahs, both before and after Jesus, all, all talked about well, mostly talked about political revolution and rising up against Rome. Because this sense of God delivering us again from our foreign occupiers and enemies uh, was very, very strong. Which is why in Jesus' day, um, probably one out of every two moms named their son yeah, their firstborn, the first son they had was named Jesus or a variant on the name of Jesus. Joshua is a variant of the word of the name Jesus. So um, this fervor was rising and rising. And so what you see in 166 BC is finally Jewish independence. They have not been independent since about 587 BC. You do the math. That's a lot of years. They have not been independent for 400 years. That's twice as long as the history of the United States of America. Almost. But you have independence under the Maccabees and the Hashmonean dynasty. And they, the spreading of Messianic hope went wild during this period. It couldn't last. It couldn't last with the movement of larger forces in the Mediterranean bases. But for almost a hundred years, they had a kind of form of independence. It was nevertheless still highly autocratic, almost monarchic, uh, and um, the average everyday, ordinary Jewish person didn't necessarily have it very good. In fact, if I was a Jew living sometime around 150, 160 BC, I'd much rather live in Alexandria in Egypt, in the Jewish community there, or frankly in Babylon. 
in Mesopotamia. So, they have this brief flourish of quasi-independence until 63 BC, thereabouts, when they now fall under Roman rule. Um, let there be a lesson in this. The, the leading, the leaders of these families um, had a squabble, and so they appealed to Mark Antony and to Rome to help them beat their um, uh, um, opponent for the rule of the Jewish people. And of course, any Roman general would gladly say, sure, <laughs> just tell me where you need me, and I'll be there. And so they fell under Roman rule. That is the cost. Now, what's important in this lesson is, number one, be careful who you make alliances with, right? And that applies not just for governments, it applies for friendships too, might I add. Be, you know, Jesus told his disciples, be as gentle as doves, but as cunning as servants. <laughs> so, you know, be careful who you make your alliances with. Um, but this harks back to first Isaiah. Do you remember how when we looked at the prophet, uh, the first prophet Isaiah, the early part of that prophetic book, how he warned and counseled uh, the king in Jerusalem, do not make an alliance with Egypt. Do not, even though you've got Assyria knocking on your door, do not make alliances with these other pagan nations. That was good advice. It would have been good if it had been taken hundreds of years later as well. And so, then from 63 on, you have Roman rule. And uh, as you know, Rome, in one shape or another, basically rules, except for a few incursions here and there from time to time, uh, rules this area until um, the 600s AD, uh, when the Byzantium, the eastern half of the Roman Empire, uh, is ruling over this. But then in the 7th century, in the 600s, what do you have sweeping out of Saudi Arabia? Islam, exactly. Uh, and then it uh, basically gets turned over and, and given over from Byzantium into the caliphates uh, that will follow. Um, <clears throat> not my specialty. Once Rome is done, I'm sort of exceedingly an amateur. But, um, okay. Now during this period, look at B, 1B, there are some gaps in the historical record. And we must assume that the role of prophet continued, but probably in a minor way. Why do we assume it continued? Because it's still going on in Jesus' time, in the first century. Later uh, in our study stuff, uh, Jesus asked his disciples, who do people say that I am? Yeah, that you're John the Baptist, come back or that you are one of the great prophets. And we, we see in the book of Acts, we also see in the Jewish Christian community, uh, the prophetic office being practiced, being that vocation being used. So um, it continued, but in an altered and different way. Um, in the first century, where we have now um, the New Testament writings, we can look at this in perhaps a more effective and complete way now that we have a little bit better documentation. Along with Josephus, you all know, do you all have a copy of Josephus? Somebody said yes. It makes me so happy. <laughs> Josephus is a first century Jew um, who basically defects uh, from Judaism uh, to uh, the monarchy of Rome. Uh, by that, he becomes a part of the court of, of the emperor, and he writes uh, several histories. A uh, history of the Jewish people, the history of the Jewish wars, uh, and uh, in a way that is 
carefully flattering to Rome, uh, but at the same time gives us a lot of first century BC and AD information about Judaism. Um, the accuracy of those accounts has been sometimes called into question, but nevertheless, it's it's a helpful summary. Uh, and there are there is, I think I just saw in the book review a brand new translation. Uh, most of us are using the uh, the uh, fifteen dollar editions of the translation of Thaddeus somebody or other from the eighteen eighties into English. Uh, but there is a new, a newer English translation of Josephus, even newer than uh, um, who is the prof at uh, Western? Um, Meyer. Meyer. Uh, he did a translation of Josephus about 15, 10 years ago, I think. Did Josephus write in Greek? Yes. Uh, was yes. It, was it canonized? No. No. Okay. Let's look at John the Baptist. What do you know about John? Before you look down at your paper, what do you know about John the Baptist? Or as one of my old colleagues used to say, he's not a Baptist, he's not a Methodist. <laughs> it's John the Baptizer. Uh, and so, um, all right, I stand corrected. I still call him the Baptist. Um, yeah, Roy? I have a couple of things. Okay. He wore the camel skin, and he ate locusts and honey. Not camel skin. Camel hair. hair. Yeah, woven from camel hair. Skin would have been a whole lot better. Oh, okay. <laughs> Wasn't he a, a cousin? Well, he was a relative. Uh, it, we, we don't know the proximity in the clan between Mary and Elizabeth, Elizabeth John's mom. Um, but we do know that they're of the same clan. They're kin. They're kinfolk. Uh, and in fact, that's the way it's often translated, right? Mary went to see her kinswoman, uh, Elizabeth, when they were both pregnant. Now stop and think about this. Do you see the irony in the meeting of Mary with her kinswoman, Elizabeth, both pregnant? The irony is, first of all, inescapable, but it is simply stunning. And that is, Elizabeth is well past childbearing age. She shouldn't be pregnant at all. Which is why her husband sort of doubted when the angel announced, right? Her husband's name? John. Zechariah. 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 Very good. And he was actually um, a functionary in the temple. Uh, and um, certain months out of the year. Uh, they obviously lived in a village outside, far away from Jerusalem. But um, uh, so here's Elizabeth who has no right to have a, who physically speaking has no right to have a baby. Greeted by her kinswoman, Mary, who morally has no right to be pregnant. <laughs> to get, and, and so you've got this end of the age spectrum greeting. Probably a 14 or 15 year old, if in fact um, she was, you know, betrothed to uh, Joseph in the customary way at the customary time in life, she was probably 14 or 15 years old. And so you've got these two unbelievably inappropriate pregnancies, and the moms greeting each other. And what does John the baptizer do in the womb? Yeah, it says he leaps. Now, having never <laughs> carried a baby, but having seen elbows and, and legs sticking out of Karen's stomach uh, for our two daughters, uh, I'm assuming that it really meant that the baby just got super active. I don't think you can leap in a womb. <laughs> That'd be kind of hard to do. Uh, but. But the baptizer is already doing his vocation. Have you caught on to that? His whole task is to announce that the kingdom of God is at hand 
And behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, right? And even before he's born, in the presence of Jesus, before he's born, the baptizer's already doing his thing. That's amazing to me. It's one of my favorite stories. Um, so if you look at John the Baptist as a prophet, because he was considered a prophet, uh, we hear him referred to as a prophet. Jesus himself calls John the, pro the greatest prophet born of woman. So here's what you hear from the song. Zechariah sang a song. <clears throat> it seems in the Gospel of Luke, everybody's singing a song. Yeah. Right? <laughs> if you know, what's that? They're very musical. They're very musical. Spoken like a true musician and teacher of music. Uh, but Luke, don't let, it, don't let that go away from your heart and your thought. Luke really loves to record these songs of faith. And when you see a song, it's important in the Gospel of Luke. You've got one by Zechariah. You've got one from Mary, right? You've got one from uh, Simeon, the old man in the temple. Uh, when Jesus is eight days old, and they take him for the rite of purification to the temple. Um, and in case you're wondering what kind of a trip that is, uh, the distance from Bethlehem to Jerusalem is how many miles? Yeah, seven. Certainly maximum seven or eight. Yeah. Um, so, uh, and the Song of Simeon is one of my favorite faith statements <coughs> in all of Scripture. Do you know what it is? According to your word. Yeah. I think the words depart in peace, but but the implication is, yeah, I'm done. Well, he was very old. Yeah, he was very young. He was. Uh, Lord, this was a song we sang at Vespers when Lutherans did evening worship uh, and you had Vespers. It was a part of the Vesper service, the Song of Simeon. Lord, now lettest thou thy servant depart in peace according to thy word. For mine eyes have seen thy which thou hast prepared before the face of all people. A light to lighten and the glory of thy people, Israel. Stop it. I get goosebumps even now. Just reciting. So, when you're reading in Luke, look for the songs. They're important. Um, because this is, this is an announcement, if you will, for Luke. The Song of Simeon is an announcement that what has been has now given way to the promise fulfilled. Um, and uh, it's extremely beautiful. So what does Jesus say about John? Will someone read this text in Matthew 11, 8 to 10? You can read out your scripture or it's printed on the page. Either one works. If not, what did you go out to see? A man dressed in fine clothes? No, those who wear fine clothes are in king's palaces. And what did you go out to see, a prophet? Yes, I tell you, and more than a prophet. This is the one about whom it is written, I will send my messenger ahead of you, who will prepare your way before you. So Jesus calls him a prophet. So when you think of what a prophet is and what a prophet does, and you look at John, you see that he really does fit in and fill the classic prophet description. He's an outsider, right? Remember that? He's an outsider. Um, he is not affluent. He may not even be literate. We don't know that about John, but it would not surprise me. Um, he does wacky things. He eats locusts. Have you ever seen a locust? Yes. They're not the same in the Middle East from here, but you get the idea. They're crunchy. <laughs> and uh, and goes for, uh, eats honey and, and locusts. 
Um, how do you get honey when it when you're not working with hives? Because they had hives, but they didn't have hives where he was preaching. So how did he get his honey? In the wild. Just like an American bear. Yeah, you 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 go in 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 wherever this hive is, uh, probably there in the rocks, and you dig it out. Can you imagine what you look like for about five days? <laughs> Maybe use smoke, can't you? <laughs> <laughs> Let's see. Oh, yeah, actually, he smoked panatellas. No. <laughs> oh, well, it is possible. Sure, I'm not good. We don't know. But let's put it this way. He was weird. This guy is strange. But that's what prophets are. And what? And let me read what Herod Antipas. You know, when you read about the Herods in the New Testament, there's more than one Herod. You do know that Antipas is the son of Herod the Great, um, and he may very well have killed Herod the Great. Although, is it in Josephus where it says that he was eaten by worms uh, from the inside out? I think that's Josephus. Remember Josephus? That's the only way to do it, mm -hmm. from the inside out. <laughs> What's that? That's the only way to do it, from yeah, the from inside the... out. <laughs> yeah. Never mind. A thought came to my mind, and it's just not worthy of shame. Um, you ever seen those little round pretzels with the cheese inside? Sure. You gotta suck the cheese out. If inside out. Never mind. That's what I mean. So you those little round pretzels. Um, in Matthew 14, verse 5, it says, Herod wanted to kill John, but he was afraid. Yeah, because prophets are messengers of God. And they are fearsome and they're weird. And we all know that weirdness sometimes means that perhaps there's God's power going on in them. Because he was afraid of the people because they considered John a prophet. So John was perceived as a prophet. And he fit the description. We talked about that. So if you'll turn your page over. So the office of prophet continues into the New Testament and into the early church as well. Um, even Paul, when he talks about the gifts of the Holy Spirit, what is one of those gifts? The gift of prophecy. The gift of prophecy. That is speaking forth, forth telling God's revealed word. Um, Jesus also has and exercises a prophetic role. And it's kind of important. I think prophets also, the modern way, I may have quoted this to you, the modern way of uh, looking at a prophet is that what a prophet proclaims is comfort to the afflicted and affliction to the comfortable. Right? Uh, and Jesus certainly did that. He most certainly did that. But in his prophetic role, not just Messianic, because there comes a point in time where Messianic, Rabbinic, and Prophetic, uh, all those lines get blurred in Jesus Christ. All of those lines get blurred. Because He is the one that God has promised. His assumption uh, that all who follow His teachings will be prophetic and therefore suffer the consequences. Because what did they do to prophets a lot of the time? Yeah. Killed them, tortured them, punished them, beheaded them, whatever. But look what Jesus says in Matthew 5. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who came before you, who were before you. He's basically lining up his disciples into the historic prophetic role. 
This really becomes important when we look at ourselves as modern Christians. Because I guess I throw out to you the question, when was the last time you acted prophetically? Considering the historic definition of prophet. When was the last time you raised a ruckus that was about God's will and God's message? When was the last time you thought of yourself as someone who carries the message of God to God's people? As we used to say in the 60s, that's heavy, man. <laughs> Isn't that what you do? Yeah? But here's one of the problems with a professional elite clergy. Now, don't get me wrong. I don't consider myself elite. <laughs> you know me better than that. I'm being a little tongue-in-cheek, but not completely. The problem is that when you have the mixture of roles, because pastors, clergy, who go to the seminary and get trained and, and learn the biblical languages and do the historical study and hopefully have that faith alive and well in their hearts, they are not just prophets. They're also priests. Yes? What I do on Sunday morning Stop and think about it. When I'm at the altar, I'm being a priest. I'm being an intercessor and one who leads God's people in worship and the sacrifice of our hearts. I'm being a priest. When I clamber into the pulpit, You're a rabbi. I'm a rabbi and potentially a prophet as well. The problem with that is you never see prior to um, Christianity of uh, the second century and on, you really never see all those roles wrapped into one with God's people. We have done it. Why? Well, for a lot of reasons, but I think we continue to do it now because it's convenient. I've all told you the story of Pastor Chuck Aker, who called me from Minnesota in my first year here. He had retired from Zion. And he was up in Minnesota, in uh, Rochester, uh, Minnesota, where his wife Sharon was a nurse at Mayo. And uh, he was reading the tower because we were sending it to him. We still do, Sharon. Uh, and uh, he called me and he said, Barry, this is Chuck. I see you're doing the Stephen ministry. How did you get them to do that? <laughs> and I said, what? And he said, I tried for a decade to get the leadership of Zion to do the Stephen ministry. And I said, why didn't it happen? And he said, because the leadership told me, no, that's what we pay you to do. Do you see the problem? Mm -hmm. The problem is that the role of prophet, first of all, was not exercised by someone who was highly trained, who had all these wonderful languages and knew all this history and could do all the theological uh, stuff. It was an outsider who was typically poor, typically illiterate, and who was called out of the fig tree grove to proclaim and to foretell God's word to royalty, to priests, and to people. So, when Jesus says to his disciples, you're going to be prophetic, get prepared for this, because there are going to be people who don't like you. That's something we need to reclaim today, I'm convinced. You are all called to be prophetic. But there's a price that comes with that. There'll be people who won't like you. 
I doubt if you'll be thrown in a dry well. But there will be people who will not like you. And that's what Jesus is warning his followers. You're going to, you cannot not be, sorry for the double negative, prophetic. It's not possible to not be prophetic as God's people. Because when you're not prophetic, you're not God's people. Is that too strong? Well, I'll let you be the judge of that. Because you are prophets. And you have been called to know God's word so that you know what you are foretelling. How did the people perceive Jesus? Matthew 21, verses 10 through 12. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred up and asked, Who is this? And the crowds answered, This is Jesus. Who? The prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. Jesus entered the temple courts, and as a prophet, he immediately drove out all who were buying and selling. Oh, boy. <laughs> How to make friends and influence enemies, right? He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves. One of the reasons, one of the reasons... Uh, that is suggested for Jesus' anger isn't the fact, just the fact, that they were selling the animals in the holy precinct. For, they were for sacrifice, right? Now, if you were coming on a pilgrimage from Alexandria in Egypt, from the Jewish community there, you likely would not be bringing your sheep with you to sacrifice. You would buy one at the temple. Right? And so in and of itself, um, there is this sense that that's not what really ticked off the prophetic Jesus. Now, how are you going to buy the lamb at the temple? You go inside the gate into the courtyard. How are you going to buy the lamb? Money. Yeah. Well, local currency. Well... The beauty of it is, is they lived with the euro. <laughs> they had Roman currency, right? It was all of the Mediterranean world. And it was all good, and, and oftentimes you will still find uh, Roman coins that have teeth marks in them, because they would bite into it to see how soft it was. Softer it was, probably the pure, the silver, the, or the gold. Not much gold, but silver. Um, uh, and... Um, you know why on coins we have all those little edges along the, the edge of the coin? No? Yeah, so you can't shave metal off the coin. That's, if you've ever wondered why all those you have that serrated edge all the way around the coin, it's to make sure you can't shave, you know, you can make a coin still pretty round, just shave a little bit off. And if you did that to a thousand silver coins, you could go buy some property on Lake Superior. You know, and, uh, well, maybe back then. And uh, um, so there were all kinds of ways to try and keep people from distorting, shaving, and ripping off from the coins. But you use Roman coins. That's what you've got in your pocket. When you came from Alexandria, uh, they were stamped at different mints. And there were different kinds of coins stamped at different... Uh, authorized mints of Rome across the empire. But guess whose image is always on Caesar. the front side? Caesar. And guess what it calls him? God. Divine Caesar. It lists him as a god. And guess what you better not do if you're going to walk into the temple of, of Yahweh in Jerusalem. You better not have any false images, any graven images of false gods. And so what they would do, the money changers would do, is they would exchange your Roman coin for Tyrian, remember Tyre and Sidon? Tyrian shekels. Because Tyre was granted uh, by the emperor a special, uh, if you will, for money, a special license 
for minting coins that did not have his image on them. So what did the Tyrian shekel have on it? Yeah, a tree, a palm, a palm leaf, uh, agrarian motifs, but no human image and nothing that declared a god out of whatever it was pictured. And then with the Tyrian shekels, you would then buy your sacrifice and take it to the priests to sacrifice. The suggestion is, from some scholars, that what you had were money exchangers who when they put your money on this side, used weights that were not true. And you're a pilgrim, right? And you're at the mercy of the people, of the merchants of Jerusalem and those at the temple. It's a yeah, tourist trap. Tourist trap is a good phrase. <laughs> no, that's actually, I like it. It's true. It is true. Um, and so, using false weights for a false exchange, they would rip you off. And pilgrims often were very poor. They would save a lifetime to come to the temple in Jerusalem to make that pilgrimage to sacrifice uh, to Yahweh. Um, and so when Jesus goes in and immediately overturns the tables and um, um, kicks people's bodies, one of the accounts says that he had a whip of cords. He actually whipped them. He was truly being prophetic. He was truly uh, being outraged by the immoral practices of God's people. And of course he didn't make any friends doing it. Um, look at those whom Jesus healed. Will someone read that text from John 9, 16 to 17? Some of the Pharisees said, This man is not from God, for he does not keep the Sabbath. But others asked, How can a sinner perform such signs? So they were divided. <clears throat> then they turned again to the blind man. What have you to say about him? It was your eyes he opened. The man replied, He is a prophet. Obviously, he believed Jesus was a prophet. And this, this then also brings up this historic notion of prophets as those who can in uh, certain circumstances with the power of God work miracles. Mm -hmm. He is a prophet. I love this story, by the way. This is a great story. When he, what follows here is when he says he is a prophet, <laughs> the... Uh, the Jewish leaders say, well, what do you know anyway? You're just some dumb blind guy. <laughs> and so the guy says, well, talk to my parents if you don't believe me. They know I've been blind from birth. <laughs> you know, so they ask him, who do you say he is? And when he gives them the right answer, they say, well, you're dumb anyway. You don't know anything. <laughs> that sounds like two siblings arguing with each other, you know? And look at Peter's confession in Mark chapter 8. Jesus and his disciples went on to the villages around Caesarea Philippi, just now starting to be excavated in the last 10 years. Never really excavated before that. Uh, a great uh, Greco-Roman style city up in the north. On the way, he asked them, who do people say I am? They replied, some say John the Baptist. Others say Elijah. And still others, one of the prophets. But what about you? Jesus said. Again, one of the, the most important moments, I think, in the Gospels, where Jesus, Jesus sets them up. So what are people saying about me? He doesn't care. He really doesn't care about that. What he really cares is, what do you think about me? And who, who am I to you? Uh... And Peter answered, you know, Peter, who usually gets it wrong, got it right. It was his turn. Yeah, it was his turn. The odds are sometimes in your favor, you know. 
You are the Messiah. And so here again, you have this sort of, the lines of definition not clearly drawn between the office of prophet and the role of Messiah. But Peter gives Jesus the answer he hopes he will hear from their hearts. You are, you are the long-expected Messiah. You all know what y'all? I've been using that word a lot lately, <laughs> y'all. <clears throat> I thought I would never do that. Uh, you all um, know what Messiah means? Anointed one. Anointed one. Uh, it's Hebrew. Uh, and it means uh, the one who is anointed. And who is the one in uh, ancient Hebrew who is anointed? The king. The king is anointed. In Greek, that word is translated into Greek as Christos. Christ. So when you see the title Christ, it is the equivalent of the Hebrew Messiah. It is the anointed king of the house of David. Uh, great confession. Jesus' public pronouncements. This is important because uh, in this text in Luke, <clears throat> I think this is the only place it occurs in the Gospels, if I'm not mistaken. In Luke 13, uh, Jesus is confronted by the people saying, you better get out of here because Herod uh, is looking to take your life. And of course, that becomes even more real in the light of the beheading of John the Baptist, or baptizer, right? So, uh, and what is Jesus' response? Will someone read Jesus' response? Go tell that fox, I will keep on driving out demons and healing people today and tomorrow, and on the third day I will reach my goal. In any case, I must press on today and tomorrow and the next day, for surely no prophet can die outside Jerusalem. So Jesus refers to himself as a prophet. No prophet can die outside Jerusalem. You remember, I don't know if I have it in here, I guess I do not. Um, there is a place just outside the, the, um, the old city on the south end. It's a modern uh, shrine, and it's called the Dominus Flavit. Flau, Flavit. Um, the Lord wept. The Lord cries. Uh, and you remember, that commemorates when Jesus looked upon Jerusalem, and it says he wept. And he said, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. Stoning the prophets and killing those whom God has sent to you. How many times would I have gathered you under my wings as a hand gathers her chicks? But you would not. So Jesus certainly thinks of himself in part as a prophet in the classic sense of the role of a prophet. Um, so would someone read the next one, John 4, 16 to 19? Go call your husband and come back. That one? Yeah. I have no husband, she replied. Jesus said to her, you are right when you say you have no husband. The fact is, you have had five husbands, and the man you now have is not your husband. What you have just said is quite true. Sir, the woman said, I can see that you are a prophet. Okay. <laughs> What's really important about this is, she says, I know you're a prophet because you know things about me that you shouldn't know, right? God must have revealed them to you. You know things that normally you shouldn't. But how does he, as prophet, deal with her? And this is where, in his prophetic role, he does differ from the classic prophets. Because remember, the classic prophets are all about either giving you hope for future promise, through future promise, 
or they're about saying, here is the inevitable outcome of your miserable, <laughs> your miserable uh, unfaithfulness to God's covenant. But what does Jesus say to this woman? He just tell, tells it like it is. He is not prejudicial. He doesn't say, you failure. He doesn't say, you know, you, you have done such a miserable, you've made a miserable mess out of your life. He, he's non-prejudicial. He probably says, stop and live the rest of your life. Well, of course, the whole idea behind it is that this woman will be renewed and, re, if you will, reformed in the shape of, of a uh, beloved child of God. But he doesn't do it through condemnation and threat. It's not there. You know, remember in the covenant renewal ceremony in the Old Testament, we talked about blessings and curses being shouted from Ebal and Gerizim, the two mountains up by the ancient city of Shechem, uh, which is modern day Nablus. Have you heard that name for a Palestinian town? Nablus. How did Na There's an interesting story. When Shechem was destroyed, uh, and it was, in a sense, rebuilt and then renamed, and I think it was during the Seleucid period, it was given the Greek name Neapolis, New City. Then, hundreds of years later, with the Islamic wave that came in and, and uh, appropriated that part of the world, uh, the word Neapolis, New City, basically was pronounced Nablus. I know, you're all saying, so what's that got to do with it? <laughs> it's just interesting. <laughs> Listen, you called me to be your best. <laughs> you got a problem with that, it's your fault. Okay. And she recognizes him as a prophet, but his prophetic role is one that seeks to get a foot in the door that seeks to become engaged in the life of this individual so that transformation can take place. So, transformation not out of fear. Not out of fear. Transformation out of acceptance. Out of reconciliation. Out of grace. Why do you think probably the stupidest question on the planet. Why do you think that is so hard for people to grasp, but instead they can totally get into the punishment thing? I think, well, I think there are, <laughs> I have two responses to that, which is unusual, because Karen says I always respond in threes, <laughs> which is more true. But the two responses are that, number one, uh, it's nurture. And number two, it's nature. That sounds like a cop out. It sounds like a psychological thing, doesn't it? Uh, but what I mean by that is, I think we, as we're growing up as kids, we see it in the lives of our parents. Uh, you know, you watch, you watch your parents when they have an argument. How parents and grandparents resolve differences in the presence of their children and grandchildren is absolutely key. It just, and I'm not doing this from a psychological model, I think from a biblical model, this is key. Uh, and so, you know, when Karen and I got married and we, well, as we were dating actually, and we started to get to know our each other's childhood, and you, you'd talk about what it was like growing up, I think we were both startled. You grew up in a house like that? Really? You grew up in a house like that? Really? So I think it is, we witness it. Uh, and the other thing, the nature thing, is as your son Tim and I had a conversation a week ago, he wrote a paper, 
for his Greek class at U of M on concupiscence. It's a Latin word, kind of semi made up or reapplied, or repurposed by St. Augustine in the late 4th century. And you'll find it in the, the uh, Lutheran um, uh, writings of the, the 16th century, in our confessional writings. Concupiscence is the fancy theological Latin word for original sin. Uh, I told Tim, I said, you know, when I was a student in college, and we were doing theology, went to Lutheran College pre-seminary, uh, and we were doing, discussing concupiscence. I said to Tim, I always liked that word as, as a young man. And he said, why? I said, because it kind of sounded smutty. <laughs> <laughs> it just sounds smutty. <laughs> you know? And when you're young, that's sort of engaging. You know? uh, and um, right now it doesn't do a thing for me. Um, but um, original sin. Uh, and uh, Tim uh, said to me, well, you know, where is this clearly defined in Scripture? And I said, well, there are a few, Paul, you know, makes references, oblique references, doesn't call it original sin, uh, and, um, <clears throat> but oblique references. And I said, but for my own life, and my own experience, after 64 years of living on this planet, I have never seen a single person who didn't sin. I can't remember anyone, even the best of people that I've known, that didn't just have the dark side. You know? I mean, they just do. And, and uh, I am absolutely convinced. Now, you can get anthropological about this and talk about survival instincts and, you know, and, and uh, um, descend, you know, des descending and evolving. But the reality is, is that however you want to describe it, we've, you know, each and every one of us harbors thoughts and ideas and ways of dealing with difficulties that are just frankly unhealthy and bad, are not good for the whole. I tell this story about my oldest daughter when she started to pick up her toys. I came home from church one night. Uh, Aubrey must have been, that's our firstborn, must have been about almost five years old. Kelsey, who's not about two and two-thirds of a year younger, um, we tried to make it three exactly because that's what all the psychologists said. It should be three years apart back then. Well, we were pretty close. Um, but I came home and I walked into the living room and none of Aubrey's toys were scattered everywhere like usual. And I thought, wow. And I, I found Karen in the kitchen and I said, did you, did you pick up Aubrey's stuff or did she pick it up? And she said, no, she picked it up. And so I'm basking in the light of a father whose teachings is actually starting to take root. And, and I'm feeling pretty proud at this, which is also concupiscence. But I'm feeling pretty proud at this point in time. Uh, and uh, I said to Karen, I said, wow, she's starting to listen. And she's feeling a little responsibility. And Karen looked at me and said, Boy, are you naive. <laughs> and I said, well, enlighten me. And she said, Aubrey is hiding her toys from her sister. <laughs> she doesn't want Kelsey to get her hands or her mouth on them. So she's grabbing them all and tucking them away in her closet. <laughs> That's concupiscence. <laughs> and learn that from me. Karen and I shared and continue to share everything. <laughs> we don't do this clutchy mine, not your thing. That's concupiscence. And so this impulse, uh, I, I see it as, as a kind of, um, uh, if you will, a kind of spiritual DNA issue. That we all carry it with us. That we just do. When we get old enough to think thoughts that are not kind or, or that are unhealthy, or to do things that are not kind or unhealthy, we will. 
we will. That's why we need each other. Don't you see? That's why the community of faith becomes so important. But not to stand in judgment shouting blessing and curses from either side of, of Shechem, Ebal and Gerzim at each other uh, to, to somehow annually affirm the covenant. But we need one another to lovingly, gracefully be there with and for, to guide, to share. Someone uh, several years ago here was really angry at me. I don't know why. <laughs> Actually, I guess I, it's understandable. Uh, but someone was really angry and they came up to me and said something that was kind of cruel to me. And um, <clears throat> now I could have said, ah, you broke the covenant. <laughs> You're going straight to hell. Do not collect $200. Do not pass go. But I put my arm around him. And I said, I'm, I'm, I don't believe that. I think you're angry at me. I believe that. But I don't think you really meant what you just said. And I'm just going to... We need each other to do that, don't we? We need each other to do that. As it turned out, I was right. But if we respond with God's kind of grace and forgiveness, it will reshape the relationship. It will reshape. Now, there are some people who are who are not willing for that to happen. That is true. We've seen figures in history. We may know people in our own lives. I remember going up to someone and saying, you know, we really, this standoff thing is no good. We really need um, to just shake hands, forgive each other, and move on. And he said to me, no, I don't want it. But I no longer carried the burden. He did. So, okay. Uh, Jesus as a new type of prophet, Hebrews one one to three. In the past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets. At many times and in various ways. You've just been studying that for the last month. But in these last days, underline last days. The early church in the first century and probably the first half of the second century really believed that the end of all things was at hand. That Jesus' second coming was, was not could, but was going to happen any day, any moment now. That's why Paul, uh, in his letter to the Corinthian Christians, says, you know, um, don't get married if you don't have to. There's, that takes a lot of time and energy, doesn't it? <laughs> don't get married if you don't have to because Jesus is coming any day. Spend your time and energy there. Well, here we are about 2,000 years later. Uh, and, uh, but in the scheme of things, Jesus' return is always close at hand in the greater scheme of things. Okay, in these last days he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, and through whom also he made the universe. Sounds like John, doesn't it? The Son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. So, Jesus becomes the new prophetic way. Not like the old prophets. It's really important for us to understand that, that whole evolution and process of the prophetic office uh, in the Bible and in the history of God's people and its importance and primacy uh, at various times in the life of God's people. Um, and it's important that we not lose 
the prophetic impulse. One of my profs years ago um, at the seminary referred to it as the prophetic impulse. That is the willingness to let God speak through you, um, the um, openness to the uh, impulse of the Holy Spirit uh, as a way of speaking honestly to your friends, your family, to the people around you, to the political leaders. You will never hear me get political in the pulpit. But if you want to talk politics, hang around. <laughs> uh, so, you know, I, I remember a lot of pastors over the years, the uh, old school pastors saying, you never talk politics, ever. And, and I just don't think that's right. I think you don't impose politics. I think you don't use the pulpit as a bully pulpit. That's wrong. There's only one proclamation that should be coming from the pulpit. And that is the good news of Jesus Christ and Christ's teachings. Uh, but I think that as God's people, we all have a responsibility to talk about how we understand God's power and presence in every aspect of life. By the way, this whole idea of secular and sacred, you know, you come here and you do the sacred stuff, you go out there and you do the secular stuff. That's not a biblical idea. There is no division. There is no separate camps for that. Biblically, it's all sacred. All of it. Every last bit of it. So when you clock in at work tomorrow, or when you get up and go to the doctor's office, these are all sacred places. Who is the philosopher who probably did the damage of dividing us, uh, our way of thinking into sacred and secular? Dr. Spock. Dr. Spock. No. <laughs> but if you followed some of his childhood psychiatry, you'd be in trouble. Descartes? Descartes, yeah. Descartes. Um, there are a couple of recent, in the last two or three years, a couple of really good books out, readable books, out on Descartes. Uh, and um, so I recommend you go to Amazon.com or one of the local bookstores and just look around. Um, we're done early tonight. Don't ever expect that to happen again. <laughs> and we got the whole, of course it was more limited. Alan? <laughs>